I'm doing really good. It's good to be back with you. Um, did you guys learn anything last night? I don't know. We learned that we put in the wrong video, but it worked, right? God is amazing. Um, if you have your Bibles, we're going to turn to Genesis, the first chapter, and we'll just hold it in uh, waiting there. Um, while you're turning there, you know that I'm from Council Bluffs, Iowa, which is smack dab in the middle of not the United States, but uh, Iowa is known for corn. Does anybody, can anybody tell me anything they know about corn? It's yummy, yes. <laughs> That's very good, yes. That would be the sweet corn is very yummy if it's, if it's done correctly. It's, it's really good. Uh, let me ask you this. Do you know what the, uh, what the silk represents in a corn, uh, corn on the cob? For each kernel, yes. Did anybody know that? It's free. Okay, well, you guys are probably all from Iowa then or something like that. Um, do you know that the rows of corn are always an even number? Did anybody know that? So you're going to go home, and here's your homework to get a corn on a cob, and you're going to count those rows and make sure that they're all even, right? Anyway, um, let me just tell you real quick, there is a dish in uh, Iowa that they love to eat. I know we love Maryland crabs here. Uh, we miss it. Uh, we order, actually, we've had them shipped to us from GNMs, which is one of our favorite restaurants. And we always get them in, in Council Bluffs, Iowa, and we think, we're probably the only people in Iowa that are eating Maryland crabs at this very moment. Uh, but there is a dish uh, that uh, they eat in Iowa. Um, it's called cornaroni. Yes, what they do is they take macaroni and they put corn in it. Macaroni and cheese, yes, and they put corn in it. And you're thinking, wow, that's kind of gross. Well, the very first time I ate it, I thought there's a texture in here that I'm not used to, uh, but a lot of people love it out there. And so I would challenge you, if you want to go home, go ahead and make your macaroni and cheese and put that good old sweet corn in there and see if it tastes good, right? I don't know. You're probably thinking, no way. Well, you know what? When I ate crabs for the very first time, I was like, no way. Who eats this stuff? It was nasty. Anyway, we're um, looking at um, the creation story, and we're looking at the narrative uh, of creation. Uh, how many of you think that it really matters if God created all things in six literal days, or he did it over a lengthy period of time? Does it, does it matter? Okay. Um, well, I'm glad that you think it matters. But uh, there's a lot of people who think it doesn't matter. I remember just not too long ago, I was speaking with somebody, and I was talking to them about the creation story and talking about the, the literal days. And uh, this is exactly what he said. What does it matter? Uh, I'm saved anyway. It doesn't matter if there were six literal days or long periods of days. And I thought to myself, well, it does matter. Um, and we're going to see that in just a few mi minutes here. Uh, maybe you're sitting here this evening, and that's what you believe. Uh, I got to be honest with you, before I became a Christian, it didn't matter to me. Um, didn't matter at all. I was there myself. But it does matter. And the more I studied and the more I did my research, the more I concluded that it, it does matter. As a matter of fact, we're going to see that it has Huge, huge implications. See, sometimes I think we Christians kind of live in a bubble, don't we sometimes? Uh, we go to church and everything is great within these walls of this building and we meet on the Lord's Day and we sing a few songs, we hear the Apostles' Doctrine preached, we have our prayers, we meet around the Lord's table and we have this wonderful fellowship and we live out Acts, the second chapter, in, in verse 42, as the early church did. And we leave and we go home and we try to live out the, uh, the Christian life during the week. And that's all great. But I'll tell you what, when you're out in the world, there's a lot of people who think differently than us, correct? And you may be challenged. And, and they're going to tell you things like we already talked about last night. That Bible stuff is but, a, a bunch of uh, a myths. And they're going to poke holes at the scriptures. It's a bunch of fairy tales and myths. They're going to speak uh, to you about the creation myth as if it really didn't happen. As the Bible teaches, just a bunch of Sunday school fun facts. 
and allegories and what have you. But last week, we came to the conclusion that this is God's Word, and we want to trust what God's Word says, right? So let me reiterate some, some scriptures that we talked about last night and then add some more. Um, would somebody like to look up Galatians, the first chapter, and verses 11 through 12? If we could have those scriptures up there. How about uh, someone get that, someone have their Bible? And then 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, verses 1 through 2. Titus 1, 13 and 14, and 1 Timothy 4, 6 and 7. So who has Galatians 1, 11 through 12? Okay, anybody? I'm going to start pointing. Anybody going once? Nobody wants to read that. Rick, would you like to read that? Thank you very much, Rick. Okay, 2 Corinthians 4, 1 through 2. Okay, you, sir, uh, in the white shirt. Titus 1, 13 and 14. Anybody else? Heidi? Yes. Um, uh, then 1 Timothy 4, 6 through 7. Okay, Tony. Let's go ahead and read those. Rick, go ahead and read that first one. Okay, so there we can sum it up as that the Apostle Paul says that his words didn't come from man, but it came from God. Okay, 2 Corinthians 4, 1 through 2. So the bottom line with the apostle there is, is saying, the apostle Paul, is that ref, they refuse to alter God's word because it is the truth, okay? Uh, and then Titus 1, 13 through 14. Myths are for the perishing. Stop, you, you know, we're not going to learn things that are going to teach us from myths, okay? And then the last one. 1 Timothy 4, 6 through 7. Who was that? Tony? Okay, so have nothing to do with myths. Some translations say have nothing to do with fables. Can you imagine if the apostles' teachings, uh, they started teaching fables uh, while making such strong denials? Fables are subject to alterations and interpretations, but the Word of God is not a collection of fables. The Word of God is something that you and I can trust. So uh, as you go out in the world, you're going to be challenged because people are going to ask you things uh, because you're a Christian. And I want you to have a good foundation of what the Bible says, and I believe that the church here wants you to have a good foundation of what the Bible says, and that's one of the reasons why they have this uh, Jurassic Park uh, you know, VBS is because we want to know what the truth is. Uh, so let's see what the American Atheist magazine has to say, if it really matters or not, uh, it, in this area of the issue of literal six days. This is what they say. Listen to this. Christianity has fought, still fights, and will continue to fight science to the desperate and uh, over to, to the desperate end over uh, evolution because evolution destroys utterly and finally the very reason Jesus' earthly life was supposedly made necessary. Destroy Adam and Eve and the original sin and in the rubble you will find the sorry remains of the Son of God if Jesus was not the Redeemer who died for our sins and this is what evolution means then Christianity is nothing. Isn't that amazing? Okay, you see, it appears the atheist understands the issue. They understand that if, 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 if they can undermine the foundation of Scripture, Genesis 1, Genesis 2, Genesis 3, that tells us how God did it, and then we see in Genesis 3 how man had sinned and how they have uh, fallen, they say that if they, if they can undermine that, then the gospel is going to have no effect. See, it has huge implications, right? Why would I believe a God 
uh, that sent his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross for my sins and raise him from the dead three days later when I can't even believe Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. Why can't I believe that he raised somebody if, he, if, if I can't believe God if, in fact, the create, he created everything through evolution? You see, that they understand the implication, don't they? Okay. And uh, you know what's even sadder? is that there are a lot of Christians or so-called Christians that say it really doesn't matter uh, what we believe. Um, I was talking to a lady a long time ago when I worked for NSA, and I was just a brand-new Christian at the time, and she was part of a different religious group uh, who had believed that the Old Testament was just a bunch of myths and allegories, and the people weren't really real, and they were just a bunch of stories And uh, I brought up the fact that Jesus Christ referred to those people in the Old Testament. And she said it doesn't matter because it's not really true anyway. There are a lot of people who believe that. Okay. And I don't know, maybe you've uh, been that type of person also. That it's just a bunch of myths. You don't know if you can really believe it or not. Don't even know if those people are really real or not. The Bible presents, like I said last week, a problem to mankind. Do we believe it or don't we believe it? Do we endorse it or ignore it? Do we follow it or do we fight it? Uh, Do we start with the Bible, which God says is true in every detail, including history, or do we start with the changing theories of imperfect man? The Bible is either true or it's not. It's not something in between. And I don't know where you're at Do you believe that it's 100% true uh, from God? And if you do, then you can trust it. It's not just a bunch of myths or fairy tales. That's what they want to relegate this to. They want to say the creation, Adam and Eve, Noah's Ark is just a bunch of stories. Again, I was talking to a man in my congregation by the name of Justin Steinmetz. I was talking to him last, uh, talked to you about him last week. He was actually a science teacher in the school system, and he was saying that, um, uh, that uh, uh, when he was talking about all of creation is that the church needs to go further than what we have done in the past. I don't even know if you talk to your kids about creation. I don't know if you ever have, uh, but he said this. He goes, a lot of times what happens in the church is we have these Sunday school classes we have these pictures of Noah's Ark with a bunch of little animals on it. And, and, and then we talk about the story as if it is just a real story. And he said that, or if it's just a story. And then he said that we as a church need to go deeper um, because to the people out in the community and out in the culture, it looks like a bunch of fairy tales to them. And that's one of the reasons why we have classes like this. But that's not what we're teaching Because God did destroy the world, he was upset, he was angry because of man's sin, and he destroyed this world through a flood. But then they want to say that, no, that really didn't happen. It was a local flood, and so they want to relegate these things to just mere stories. The ironic, it's ironic because Darwin himself knew what he was teaching. Let me share a quote with you about what he said. He said, I'm quite conscious that my speculations run quite beyond the bounds of true science. That's what he said. And then he went on to say this. There's another quote. Um, This is from um, a man by the name of J.M. Denton Sons. And this is what he said. The fact of evolution is the backbone of biology. And biology is thus in the peculiar position of being science founded on an unproved theory. Is it then a science or, fa- or, or faith? Belief in the theory of evolution is thus exactly parallel to belief in special creation. Both are concepts which believers know to be true, but neither up to the present has been capable of proof. Introduction to the origin of, of species uh, by, the, by a man by the name of J.M. Dent and Sons uh, from 1971. This is quite extraordinary, folks. The origin of species is their Bible and beliefs. And they are admitting that they don't even have any evidence for their so-called theory. So they are even admitting that it's not even science, but it is a faith. 
And we are believing this by faith. That's what they're saying. And they're saying that they are no different than those who believe in special creation. And of course, special creation is our creator is, is God. And so they're saying we don't have a whole lot of evidence But I'm going to suggest to you today that we have a lot of evidence to believe that the Bible is true, that God is our creator, and that God did it in six literal days, and that you can trust it, okay? So I'm going to suggest that to you tonight, okay? You can trust it because God said so, right? Okay, and some of you are okay with that because you can look at the creation story and you say, you know what? I don't have a problem with that. I believe it all by faith, right? But I know that there are some people that, that, that needs more evidence from God. And some of us, we just take God at his word. Uh, if God said it, you believe it, you don't question it, um, that's faith, folks. Okay, Romans, the first chapter, verse 20. Okay, remember what it says? And anybody would like to read that? Romans, the first chapter, verse 20. So his invisible attributes are clearly seen. But for some of us, we want a little more evidence. And uh, yeah, here it is. It's, it's, it is warm up here again. So <laughs> sorry about that, guys. Uh, but some of us, we need a little more evidence. And, and maybe you little bit need a little bit more. There's nothing wrong with that either. And that's okay. So basically, here's what we have. We have two views of biblical creation. Okay. Uh, The first view is that God alone did it. And the second view is that it was God plus evolution. God alone did it. No evolution. It's it's literally six-day creation, um, 6,000 years ago, ago, uh, young, you know, it's it's a young earth, flood and post-flood events, um, explain most of the geological activity, fossils, demise of the dinosaurs, etc. So God did it alone. Uh, There's also another view. uh, God plus uh, evolution. God breaks down, God brings evolution into it. And this is broken down into three categories. There's the theistic evolution. There's the gap theory. And there's the progressive creationism. Theistic evolution is this. God is the creator. He started it all, but then he kind of left it all alone and let the process come about through evolution. That was his method. Uh, Man evolved slowly over millions of years from lower life forms. Theistic evolution. The gap theory, has anybody ever heard of the gap theory before? Okay, some of us have suggests that the days of the Bible are six literal days, but before that, there was this gap between Genesis 1, 1 and Genesis 1, 2, and they believe that there is an implied gap of, of time of vast length which would allow the geological, the science that deals with the Earth's physical structure and substance ages. This is also called the ruin and reconstruction theory. According to this concept, Genesis 1-1 describes the initial creation of the universe. Following this, the standard events of cosmic evolution took place, which eventually produced our solar system about 5 billion years ago. Then on Earth, the various geological ages followed, um, the dinosaurs and what have you. But then there was a devastating cataclysm, destroying all life on Earth and leaving a vast fossil graveyard everywhere. This situation is then said to be what is described in Genesis 1-2. The cataclysm is thought to have occurred because of the rebellion of Satan and his angels against their creator in heaven. Those who advocate the gap theory agree that the six days of creation week were literal days, but they interpret them only as days of recreation with God creating again many of the kinds of animals and plants destroyed in the cataclysm. Okay, isn't that crazy? 
Okay? This was developed mainly for the purpose of accommodating the great ages demanded by evolutionary geologists. It was first popularized by a Scottish theologian, somebody who believed in the Bible. His name was Thomas Chalmers early in the 19th century. Okay? That's the gap theory. And then there's the progressive creationism where God was active during those six days of ages. He was active, but he was using evolution during those six-day ages. Okay? What are you going to believe? Okay? How can we really decide which one of these are correct? Right? Well, here's what I suggest us to do. We, we're going to use the Bible. We're going to look at the biblical evidence to see what it has to say. Remember what we said last night in Psalm 119, verses 1, verse 160. We want to look at the sum of your word, God says, is truth. We don't want to take bits and pieces and kind of make up our own thing. But we want to take the sum of your word is truth. And then in Proverbs, the 30th chapter, in verse 6, it says this. Don't add to God's word. Okay. In the restoration movement, we have this phrase that uh, we used to say a long time ago. Where the Bible speaks, we speak. Remember that? Where the Bible is silent, we are silent. So how should we interpret Genesis, the first chapter? So we're going to go ahead and read uh, the first six days. And so if anybody would like to read Genesis, the first chapter. And uh, let's begin... Well, let's just read the whole chapter, okay? Would you guys like to do that? Would you want me to read it, or do you guys want to? Hetty, you want to read it? Okay, let's just, let's just hear it. Start in the very first verse.
Amen. Thank you, Hetty. She did a great job. Okay, here's, here's what I'm going to say as, as she read that to you and as you followed it. Um, if you were to read Genesis 1 and put aside all the outside influences and just let the words of the pa- that passage speak to you and just take it for face value that God created the universe, the earth, the sun, and the moon, and the stars, and the plants, and the animals, and the first two people within six ordinary days, you would have to admit that you could never get the idea of millions of years, right? Just take it for face value, because it's not there, right? So what does that say to me? Well, it's obvious. Many have been influenced by ideas from outside of scriptures uh, do you see the problem there? Uh, then they, if, if they could be outside, if they could be influenced by outside the scriptures with Genesis 1, then they could allow any word to be reinterpreted by the preconceived ideas of the person reading those words. Does that make sense? And that happens all the time, doesn't it? The, you'll hear people say something like this. Well, that's really not what God's word says. Has anybody ever heard anybody say that? I know talking to people, I'll read them a scripture and they'll just say, that's not what it really means. And I'm like, okay, well, you tell me what it means because we just read Genesis 1. And so what happens is we bring these outside influences in to help us to interpret it. But here's what I also want you to know. When it comes to days, the Bible interprets itself literally. And I want to prove that to you here this evening. If somebody would like to uh, look up Jeremiah, the 25th chapter, verses 11 through 12, okay? Uh, Daniel, the 9th chapter, uh, verse 2, Second Chronicles 36, verses 20 through 21. We're just going to look at some scriptures here, and we're going to see that the Bible is going to interpret itself, okay? So uh, Jeremiah 25, uh, 11 through 12. This is God speaking through the prophet Jeremiah. So here is this prophet Jeremiah speaking by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And he is saying that God has decreed 70 years that they are going to be in captivity. So somebody go ahead and read that. Who has that? Please. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Okay, so for 70 years, you're going to be in captivity, correct? Okay. Well, what do later interpreters understand? Daniel, okay, read the ninth chapter in verse 2. Go ahead, somebody like to read that? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so we have Daniel. This is about 70 years later, and he's reading the book of Jeremiah. And so Daniel's getting quite excited, and he thinks it's coming to an end. Uh, The 70 years are almost up. But notice he didn't interpret 70 years as some strange allegorical number meaning something else. That's what I want you to see, folks. No, he knew that 70 years meant what? 70 years, right? Right? And, and, and years really mean what? Years. Uh, he understood that to be literal. Okay, and then Second Chronicles 36, verses 20 through 21. Uh, we have the writer of Second Chronicles. Uh, this is about uh, 450 B.C. And this is what the writer says. Somebody go ahead and read that. Yes, Mark. Seventy years. So again, this is approximately 750 BC. The writer is saying, 
I'm reading those 70 years in the book of Jeremiah, and I'm understanding it to be 70 years. 70 is a real number, and years are a real period of time. Can we conclude that? Okay. Are you following along with me? Okay. Hope I'm making sense here. So here we have two biblical writers interpreting an early biblical writer saying, we're supposed to understand that literally. Well, what about the Hebrew word? I'm, I don't know if you ever heard this before, but the Hebrew word uh, for day is the Hebrew word yom. Can everybody say yom? Yom, okay? Um, and this word can be used for definite and indefinite periods of times. Indefinite would be, you know, a time in the past, right? So let me give you an example of that. Like back in the day... At First Christian Church, we used to have a Glen Burnie Bible Institute, right? Is that true? Okay. Back in the day, you know, we've used phrases like that before. That's an indefinite period of time. It could also be used as a span of someone's life if someone reads Genesis, the fifth chapter, verse four. Okay. Genesis, the fifth chapter, verse four. Say that again. Yes, Genesis 5, 4. Okay, so 800 years. Okay, that definitely shows an indefinite period of time. Correct? Okay, are you following with me? Okay, so here we are using days as an indefinite period of time, just like we would use it in the English language. Now, let's look at the definite use of the word day. And here's what I want to say that when you look at the scriptures, whenever you use a number in front of the word day, it always limits to a 24-hour period of time. Okay? Whenever there is the number. There are no exceptions in the Bible. So if someone would like to turn to Numbers, the 11th chapter, verse 20, You may recall as you're turning there, let's go ahead and read that, that the children of Israel were tired of eating manna. Uh, They wanted something else. They wanted God to give them meat. And God says, okay, I'll give you meat. And he says, I will give it to you for a whole month. So let's go ahead and read that in Numbers 11, 20. Somebody read that real quick. Okay, so here we can see that they understand this clearly, that they were going to eat it, what, for a whole month, and it was going to come out of their nostrils. They understood that they wouldn't be able to eat meat, you know, uh, for an extended period of time, that it would just be for a month. Uh, Let me show you another example. Numbers 29, verse 17. It's got some scriptures here to show you, so let's... uh, Go ahead and read that, Numbers 29, 17. And it, the person who reads out of Numbers 29, let's just look at all those scriptures right there. Numbers 29, 17, 20, 23, 26, 29, and 32. And then if somebody will look at Exodus, the 20th chapter, verses 1 through 17, but we're going to zero in on Exodus 20, verse 11. Okay? So who has Numbers 29, 17? Somebody, please. Yes, sir. Go ahead and read all those verses. Yep, 17. Second day. Okay, verse 20. Verse 23. Okay, 26. Verse 29 and 32. <laughs> There's a lot of lambs and bulls, right? 
Okay, uh, you know what's exciting about this verse is that it's the same language that is used in Genesis, the first chapter. It is parallel to Genesis 1, where you have one day, then you have a second day, then you have a third day. Clearly, this is being used as literal periods of time, right? Okay, does anybody argue with that? Okay, okay, and uh, then who has the last one? Exodus 20, verse 11. You could read those later, but go ahead and read that. Somebody, real quick. Yes, Exodus 20. <laughs> 1 through 17 she messed you up well we forgive people here don't we all right then let's let's <laughs> you're doing great Hetty. You know what that tells me? Don't mess around with Hetty when she's reading the scriptures, right? <laughs> You're on point, Hetty. Appreciate that very much. But here's what we conclude, that those are literally six days, correct? Would anybody, would anybody come up with that conclusion? Okay, sure. Uh, and God stated that he rested from his work of creation on the seventh day. Uh, not that he is resting, but he rested from his work. How many of you think that those ancient Jews were going around and asking, hey, does that mean I have to work six billion years? Right? Before I get a day off? They didn't. No, they knew exactly what they were speaking about. Six literal days. And the seventh was a day of rest. Okay, so where do we go from here? Yes, sir. Morning and evening. We read that in the first one. Yes. Yes. Yep, from what we read in the Genesis, the first chapter. Yep, you're absolutely right, Dave. Now, now there's some that might object, object to this because here's what we say because there's a New Testament scripture from Second Peter, uh, the third chapter in verse 8. 
because they do object to it and they say something like this, you know, well, you know, it really doesn't matter. A day is, let's read it, okay? Second Peter, the third chapter, verse eight, it says, but do, you, but do not forget this one thing, dear friends, with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years are like a day. Has anybody ever heard anybody say, quote that before, okay? And they're like, it really doesn't matter. It could be a thousand years. It could be a million years. It doesn't matter. Uh, to which I would say, you've got to keep this scripture in its proper context. Because what happens a lot of times is people will pull things out of context and they don't even know what it really means. So in its proper context, this is what it is saying. Uh, that verse is actually surrounded by, well, let's just turn there, okay? Let's just go ahead and turn there. Second Peter, the uh, third chapter, verse 8 in the New Testament. This scripture, for one thing, is not in the context of creation. Okay, it's not referring to Genesis in the creation narrative. And it's not saying that it is a thousand years. Let's go ahead and read it. Uh, 2 Peter 3rd chapter, verse 1. I'll go ahead and do it. It says, Beloved, and I'm reading from the New King James. I now write to you the second epistle in both of which I stir up your minds by way of rem reminder that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and our Savior. Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lust and saying, where is the promise of your coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in its water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth which now exist are kept in store by the same word, reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is of a thousand years, is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is longsuffering toward, uh, toward us, not willing any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Okay? It's talking about what? The second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We've got to keep it in its proper context. It is saying to God, a day is like a thousand years because God is not limited by time as we are. What may seem like a long period of time to us is nothing to God. And this is coming from God's perspective and not man's perspective. With the Lord, it's his perspective. It's not ours. Okay. Anybody have any questions? Okay, we're, we're pretty much... Uh, done right now any any questions about anything does does it does it make sense okay that was pretty easy right pretty painless okay not only that but listen to this okay uh if 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 the text of genesis 1 2 does not mean literally 24 hour day then why does jesus refer back to it okay because he believed in the historicity of Genesis 1 and 2. And not only him, but there are scriptures in the New Testament that also say that the Apostle Paul referred back to Genesis 1 and 2. So the summary of this biblical evidence is this. The Bible interprets itself literally. Day is always a definite 24-hour day if the number is before it. We see that the days of Genesis 1 was literal, and Jesus and Paul 
use it as history. Okay? Very good.